Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we're focusing on question number one. The table shows the probability that a biased dice will land on two, on three, on four, on five and on six. Neymar rolls the biased dice 200 times. Work out an estimate for the total number of times the dice will land on one or on three. It's very important to remember that the sum of the probability of all possible outcomes is one. Therefore, to find the probability of 1, we're going to add the probability of 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and subtract it from 1. So it's 0 0.17 plus 0 0.18 plus 0 0.09 plus 0 0.15 plus 0 0.1 which equals 0 0.69 therefore I'm going to take away 0 0.69 from 1 which equals to 0 0.31 therefore the probability of 1 is 0 0.31 so 1 minus 0 0.69 equals 0 0.31. Probability here is 0 0.31. To estimate the number of times the bias dice lands on 1 or 3 of the 200 throws, we need to add the probability of 1, which is 0 0.31, and probability of 3, which is 0 0.18, and then you multiply it by 200. So, probability of 1 plus the probability of 3 is equal to 0 0.31. 1 plus 0 0.18 which equals to 0 0.49 I'm now going to multiply 0 0.49 by 200 which will give us our final answer 0 0.49 9 multiplied by 200 which equals 98 so it's 98 times that the dice will land on 1 or 3 that's your final answer thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe many thanks Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 2. On Saturday, some adults and some children were in the theatre. The ratio of the number of adults to the number of children was 5 to 2. Each person had a seat in the circle or had a seat in the stools. Three quarters of the children had a seat in the stools. 117 children had a seat in the circle. There are exactly 2,600 seats in the theatre. On this Saturday, where there are people on more than 60% of the seats. You must show how you get your answer. So a quarter of the children had seats in the circle. To find out how many children altogether, we need to multiply 117 by 4. 117 times it by 4, which equals to 468 children. So in total, there are 468 children. Now the ratio given to us, for every 5 adults, there's going to be 2 children, 5 to 2. Now I'm just going to simplify the 5 to 2 even further. So it's now... 
to one adult two children So for every one child there's going to be 2.5 adults. Using the ratio we're now going to multiply 468 by 2.5 to give us the total amount of adults. So therefore the total amount of adults is 4, 6, 8, sorry, 468 multiplied by 2.5 which equals to 1170 adults I'm now going to add the number of adults and the number of children together So, so 1,170 adults plus 468 children Oops. equals 1,638 people in total. Now to find the percentage I'm going to divide 1,638 people by 2,600 and then I'm going to multiply it by 100. Over 2,000 Six hundred. Times one hundred. Which gives us sixty three percent. Therefore, the answer is yes. Because 63% is greater than 60%. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 3. The diagram shows a prism with a cross section in the shape of a trapezium. On the centimetre grid below, draw the front elevation and the side elevation of the prism. Use a scale of 2 centimetres to 1 metre. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the measurements from meters to centimeters. So two meters is four centimeters. Two meters again is four centimeters. 0 0.5 meters is one centimeter. One meter is two centimeters. 0 0.5 meters again is 1 centimeter and 2.5 meters is 5 centimeters so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scroll down the page and draw the front elevation and side elevation The base of the front elevation is 2 meters, so we need to convert that into centimeters, which is 4 centimeters. The height on the left hand side is 4 meters, so when we convert that into centimeters, which is 4 centimeters, and the height, the small height, which is on the right hand side, is uh, 0.5 meters, we convert that into centimeters, which is 1 centimeter. The base of the front elevation is 2 meters, so we need to convert that into centimeters, which is 4 centimeters. The height on the left hand side is 2 meters, so we need to convert that into centimeters, which is 4 centimeters. 
So the front elevation should look like this. One centimeters, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. One centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. One centimeter. Therefore, the front elevation will look like this. So let me just write that down, front elevation. Now we're going to draw the side elevation. The base of the side elevation is 2 cm. The length of the small height is 1 cm, while the length of the bigger height is 4 cm. So we should have 1, 2, 1, 1. The height is 4, 1, 2, 3. So the side elevation should look like this. Thank you for watching. Can you please like and subscribe? Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 4. Ollie drove 56 kilometres from Liverpool to Manchester. He then drove 61 kilometres from Manchester to Sheffield. Ollie's average speed from Liverpool to Manchester was 70 kilometres per hour. Ollie took 75 minutes to drive from Manchester to Sheffield. Work out Ollie's average speed for his total drive from Liverpool to Sheffield. Now to solve this problem, we need to be using this particular equation. Distance over speed times t. Now my next step is to form a table and fill in all the details given to us. So speed distance and time. Liverpool to Manchester and Manchester to Sheffield. The speed from Liverpool to Manchester was uh, 70 kilometers per hour, so 70 kilometers per hour and the distance was 56 kilometers let's write the total here total Now the distance from Manchester to Sheffield was 61 kilometers. 61 kilometers. And the time was 75 minutes. 
but we need to convert that into hours. And to convert that in hours, we're going to divide it by 60 minutes, which equals 1.25 hours. Our next step is to find the time it takes from Liverpool to Manchester. And the way we can do that is by dividing the distance by the speed. So the distance was 56 kilometers divided by 70 kilometers per hour, which gives us 0 0.8 hours. Now I'm going to add the total distance together which is 117 kilometers I'm now going to add the amount of hours it takes Ollie to go from Liverpool to Sheffield so it will be 0 0.8 hours plus 1.25 hours which equals 2.05 hours. Now we can work out Ollie's average speed for his total drive from Liverpool to Sheffield. I'm now going to divide the total distance, which is 117 kilometres, by the total amount of time it takes Ollie to drive from Liverpool to Sheffield, which equals to 2.05 hours. So therefore, the average speed is 117 kilometers divided by 2.05 hours, which equals 0.8 point no seven three one seven kilometers per hour so that's your final answer thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe many thanks hi and welcome to math together in this lesson we're focusing on 4b Janie drove from Barnsley to York. Janie's average speed from Barnsley to Leeds was 80 km per hour. Her average speed from Leeds to York was 60 km per hour. Janie says that the average speed from Barnsley to York can be found by working out the mean of 80 km per hour and 60 km per hour. If Janie is correct, what does this tell you about the two parts of Janie's journey? Well, the two parts must be the same. Okay, so that's your answer. So, the time taken for the two parts must be the same. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 5. ABC and EDC are straight lines. EA is parallel to DB. EC equals 8.1 centimeters. 
DC equals 5.4 centimeters, DB equals 2.6 centimeters, A. Work out the length of AE. So the first thing that we need to do is to find the scale factor and the way we can do that is by dividing the larger length which is 8.1 by the smaller length 5.4. Therefore scale factor SF equals 8.1 over 5.4 which equals to 1.5. We're now going to multiply the scale factor 1.5 by 2.6, which gives us the length of AE. So 1.5 times it by 2.6. Six, which equals 3.9 therefore A E equals 3.9 now let's have a look at question B State AC equals 6.15 centimeters. B. Work out the length of AB. So I know AC is equal to 6.15 centimeters. So I'm going to divide 6.15 centimeters by the scale factor 1.5, which equals 4.1. So 6.15. Divided by the scale factor, which is 1.5, which equals 4.1. Now, 4.1 is the length from B to C, and I need to find out the length between A to B. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to subtract. 4.1 from 6.15 to give us the length AB. So 6.15 minus 4.1 equals 2.05 centimeters. Therefore, the length of AB equals 2.05 centimeters. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi, welcome to Math Together. This lesson will be focusing on question 6. Anil wants to invest 25,000 for 3 years in a bank. Personal bank, compound interest, 2% for each year. Secure bank, compound interest, 4.3% for the first year and 0.9% for each extra year. Which bank will give Anil the most interest at the end of 3 years? You must show all your working out. It's very important that you remember the general equation for the compound interest. So it's initial investment times open brackets one plus the interest rate divided by a hundred
raised to the power of number of years. So now let's focus on personal bank. The initial investment, which is 25,000, the interest rate is 2% and the number of years is three years. So personal bank Twenty five thousand pounds multiply open brackets one plus two percent over a hundred close brackets raise it to the power of three and when you input this into a calculator your answer should be 26,530.2 So if Anil decides to use personal bank after three years, he would receive £26,530.20. Now, if Anil decides to use Secure Bank, we're just going to calculate it right now. So, Secure Bank. So, the bank offers 4.3% first year and 0.3%. 9% the following years. So we're just going to work out how much he would re receive after the first year. So the initial investment was £25,000. Times it by open bracket 1 plus 4.3 over 100 close bracket raise it to one year which equals to 26,075 pound now the initial investment is 26,075 pounds so all I'm going to do is substitute those values into the equation so it's 26 thousand and seventy five pounds multiply by open brackets one plus naught point nine over a hundred so that should be naught point nine percent raised to the power of two years and when you input this into the calculator, you should get 26,546 pounds and 50 pence. So therefore, Secure Bank will offer more interest than Personal Bank. So your final answer is Secure Bank. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 7. A number n is rounded to two decimal places. The result is 4.76. Using inequalities, write down the error interval for n. What you need to do to answer this question is you need to find the lower and upper bound of 4.76. So we have we have four point seven six and the lower bound is four 
4.755 and the upper bound is 4.765 and now I'm just going to put it into an inequality therefore 4.7 five five less than or equal to n less than or equal to four point seven six five and that's your final answer thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe many thanks Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question A. The cumulative frequency graph shows some information about the heights in centimetres of 60 students. Work out and estimate for the number of these students with a height greater than 160 centimetres. So what we need to do first is to draw a line. So what we need to do first is draw a line upward. So what we need to draw So what we need to do first is draw a line upwards from 160 centimeters. So what we need to do first is to draw a line upwards so what we need to do first is to draw a line from 160 centimetres going upwards until it hits the curved line. Going upwards. And then you read across. So that is 48 students. What we need to do next is find the difference between 60 and 48 students. So 60 students minus 48 students, which equals 12 students. So 12 students have a height greater than 160 centimeters. So that's your answer, 12 students. Thank you for watching. Can you please like and subscribe my videos? Thank you very much. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 9. The diagram shows triangle A drawn on a grid. Kyle reflects triangle A in the x-axis to get triangle B. He then reflects triangle B in the line y equals x to get triangle C. Amy reflects triangle A in the line y equals x to get triangle D. She is then going to reflect triangle D in the x-axis to get triangle E. Amy says triangle E should be in the same position as triangle C. Is Amy correct? You must show how you get your answer. Okay, so the question states Cal reflects triangle A in the x-axis to get triangle B. So I'm just going to draw triangle B. So this is my triangle B. It then also states that Kyle reflects triangle B in the line y equals x to get triangle C. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw y equals x. Now I'm going to reflect it. So this is my triangle C. Now it says Amy reflects triangle A in the line y equals x to get triangle D. So I'm going to reflect triangle A on the line y equals x to get triangle D. Triangle D. It says she is then going to reflect triangle D in the x axis to get triangle E. So I'm going to reflect triangle D on the x axis to get triangle E. says Amy says that triangle E should be in the same position as triangle C. Clearly the two triangles are not in the same position. Okay so the answer is 
No. She is not correct. C is a rotation. Oops. C is a rotation. Of a rotation of ninety degrees anti clockwise. about zero zero also E is a rotation Ninety degrees clockwise about zero zero of shape A. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 10. The table shows some information about eight planets. So we have Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Neptune, Saturn, Uranus and Venus. It says 10a, write down the name of the planet with the greatest mass. Well the planet with the greatest mass is Jupiter and this is because it's raised to the power of 27 so your answer is Jupiter. Ten B, find the difference between the mass of Venus and the mass of Mercury. So we're going to subtract the mass of Venus with the mass of Mercury. So it's four point eight six nine times it by ten raised to the power of twenty four minus the mass of Mercury which is 3.302 times 10 raised to the power of 23. You input this into a calculator, which will give us 4.5 8 times 10 raised to the power of 24.
So that's your final answer. Nishant says that Neptune is over a hundred times further away from Earth than Venus. Is Nishan right? You must show how you get your answer. Well, Neptune The distance of Neptune is 4.35 times 10 raised to power of 9 and Venus is 4.14 times 10 raised to the power of 7. So what we're going to be doing right now is dividing 4.35 times 10 raised to the power of 9 with Venus 4.14 times 10 raised to the power of 7. So 4.35 times it by 10 raised to the power of 9 over 4.14 times 10 raised to the power of 7 which equals to 105 0.72 Four. Therefore, Nishan is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank you very much. Can you please like and subscribe? Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson, I'll be focusing on question eleven. It says solve three x minus two over four minus two x plus five over three equals one minus x over six. When we add or subtract fractions, we must ensure that there is a common denominator. To find the common denominator between 4 and 3, we're going to list out the multiples of 4 and 3 and find the lowest common multiple. Okay, 3, multiples of 3 are 3, 6, 9, 12, multiples of 4, 4, 8, 12. So the lowest common multiple and the common denominator is 12. So I would need to multiply this side, the numerator and the denominator, by 3. So we should have 3, open brackets, 3x minus 2 and a denominator by 3, so 4 times 3 is 12, minus, I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 4, 4 open brackets, 2x plus 5, close brackets, over 12, equals 1 minus x over 6. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to expand the brackets and simplify it further. So we should have 3 times 3x which is 9x. 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. Minus 4 times 2x, which is minus 8x. Minus 4 times 5 gives us negative 20. Over 12 equals 1 minus x over 6. Again, I'm going to simplify it further by collecting like-for-like -like terms. So we should have x minus 26 
over 12 equals 1 minus x over 6. At this point, I'm going to cross multiply. So we should have 6 open bracket x minus 26 close bracket equals 12 open bracket 1 minus x close bracket. I'm going to expand the brackets so we should have 6 x minus 156 equals 12 minus 12 x I'm going to add 12 x to both sides so it will eliminate the negative 12 x and I'm going to add 156 from both sides so I've just moved all the x's to the left hand side and all the numbers on the right hand side. 18x equals 168. I'm going to make x the subject by dividing both sides by 18. So x should be 9 and 1 third. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson I'll be focusing on question 12. There are 30 students in Mr Lear's class. 16 of the students are boys. Two students from the class are chosen at random. Mr Lear draws this probability tree diagram for this information. 12a. Write down one thing that is wrong with the probabilities in the probability tree diagram. The probabilities for the second students are wrong. It should be something over 29. Okay, so that's the correct answer. So probabilities for second students are wrong should be something over 29. Owen and Wasim play for the school football team. The probability that Owen will score a goal in the next match is 0 0.4. The probability that Wasim will score a goal in the next match is 0 0.25. Mr. Slater says the probability that both boys will score a goal in the next match is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25. Is Mr. Slater right? Give a reason for your answer. Well, Mr. Slater is wrong and the probability should be multiplied together. So, no. Should be zero point one probability that Owen will score times 
the probability that that was seen will score. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we're focusing on question 13. The histogram shows some information about the ages of the 134 members of a sports club. 20% of the members of the sports club who are over 50 years of age are female. Work out an estimate for the number of female members who are over 50 years of age. Our first step is to find the frequency of members who are above 50 years old. To do this, we're going to be using the frequency density equation. So, FD is equal to frequency divided by class width. So between 50 to 60 years old, the frequency density is 1.4 and the class width is 10. All I'm going to do now is substitute those values into the equation and make frequency the subject. So 50 to 60, the frequency density is 1.4. Equals frequency. over the class width, which is 10. I'm now going to make frequency the subject by multiplying both sides by 10. So we should have 14 is equal to the frequency. Now we need to find the frequency of members that are aged between 60 and 90 years old. I know that the frequency density is 0.7 and the class width is 30. So all I'm going to do now again is substitute those values into the equation and make frequency the subject. So 60 to 90. We have. 0.7 equals frequency over 30. Again, I'm going to make frequency the subject by multiplying both sides by 30. Therefore, frequency is equal to 21 So I'm going to add 14 and 21 together which gives us 35 So there are 35 members at the club who are aged above 50. The question states 20% of the 35 are female. How many members are female? We need to find 20% of 35. Twenty percent of thirty five is equal to seven. So there are seven female members who are above the age of fifty. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe? Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we're going to be focusing on question fourteen. Here are some graphs. We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I.
In the table below, match each equation. In the table below, match each. In the table below, match each. In the table below, match each equation with the letter of its graph. Okay, so we're looking for y equals sine x. So that will be c. y equals x cubed plus 4x. That will be f. y equals 2 raised to the power of x. That will be a, as is exponential. And y equals 4 over x, which is h. Thank you for watching, and can you please like and subscribe? Many thanks. Hi, and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson, we'll be focusing on question 15. A, B, C, and D are points on a circumference of a circle. A, E, C, and B, E, D are straight lines. Prove that triangle A, B, E, and triangle D, C, E are similar. You must give reasons for each stage of your working. So the first thing I notice is that these angles over here are vertically opposite. So therefore, they are the same. So A, E, B equals C, E, D Uh, vertically opposite. So AEB equals CED equals vertically opposite angles are the same. So according to our circle theorems, angles in the same segment are equal. Therefore, BAE equals CDE. And also, ABE equals ECD. So let me just write that down. We have B A. E equals C D E and we have A B E equals E C D. So angles in the same segment are equal. So this angle here is equal to this angle here and this angle here is equal to this angle here. Therefore, all angles are the same, so all triangles are the same. So let me just write that down. 
therefore all angles are the same So the two triangles are also the same. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 16. Using algebra, prove that 0 0.136 reoccurring times 0 0.2 reoccurring is equal in value to 1 over 33. So we're going to convert reoccurring decimals into fractions. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to let x be the first reoccurring decimal. So, let x equals 0 0.136636 and so on. I'm then going to multiply both sides by 10. So, 10x. equals 1.3636 I'm going to multiply it again by 10x which is 100x Six, three, three. I'm then going to multiply both sides again by ten. So we have a thousand x equals to one hundred and thirty six point. Three, six, three, six, three, six. I'm just going to label all four equations. So, one, two, three, four. At this stage, I can eliminate the point. 363636 three, six, three, six, by subtracting equation 4 with equation 2. So we should have a thousand x minus 10x, which equals to 990x and 136.36636 subtract 1 Point three six three six three six, which equals to a hundred 
and 35. So effectively, overall, we should have 99, sorry, 990 x equals 135. I'm now going to make x a subject, so I'm going to divide both sides by 990, so we're left with x equals 135 over 990. Now I'm going to repeat the same process again, this time with the 0.2 reoccurring, so I'm going to let x equal 0 0.2 reoccurring. I'm going to multiply again both sides by 10. 10x is equal to 2.2 and label both equations 1 and 2 I can eliminate the 0.222 by subtracting equation 2 with equation 1 so we should have overall 9x equals to 2. I'm going to make x a subject. x equals 2 over 9. So overall we should have 135 over 990 times 2 over 9. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to simplify the fraction on the left hand side. I have 135 over 990. So first of all I'm going to divide the numerator and denominator by 5. twenty seven over a hundred and ninety eight. Again I'm going to simplify it further by dividing the numerator and denominator by three. We have nine over 66. Again I'm going to simplify it further by dividing it by 3 again. Should have 2, sorry 3 over 22. So 3 over 22 times it by the fraction on the right hand side which is 2 over 9 which equals 6 over 198. Again I'm going to simplify 6 over 198 by dividing the numerator and denominator by 6. So we should have 1 over 33. So I've just proved when you multiply the two reoccurring decimals, the answer would be 1 over 33. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 17. 
ONQ is the sector of a circle with center O and a radius 11 centimeters. A is a point on ON and B is a point on OQ such that AOB is an equilateral triangle of side 7 cm. Calculate the area of the shaded region as a percentage of the area of the sector ONQ. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. So the first thing that I like to do is put all the information given to us in the question in the diagram. It says that the radius is 11 cm. So from O to N and O to Q, the radius is 11 cm. So I'm just going to write that down, O N and O Q is 11 centimeters, 11 centimeters, 11 centimeters. It also states that O A B is an equilateral triangle of side 7 centimeters. So OA is 7 centimetres and OB is 7 centimetres. So I'm just going to write it, write it in in the diagram. So this OA is 7 centimetres and OB is also 7 centimetres. So again, 7 centimetres. Seven, seven centimeters. And it's very important to recognize that angles in an equilateral triangle add up to 60 degrees. So this particular angle is 60 degrees, this particular angle is 60 degrees, and also this angle over here is also 60, 60 degrees. So the first thing that I like to do is to find the area of the non right angle triangle. To do this, we're going to be using the equation area of a non right angle triangle. So, area of triangle equals a half. A B sine theta. Now to find the area of the triangle O A B, we need to fill in the details given to us in the diagram. So A is seven centimeters, B is seven centimeters, and the angle given to us is 60, 60 degrees. So I'm just going to sub substitute those values into the equation. So we should have equals a half times 7 times 7 times sine 60. Okay, so we plug those values into the equation and we should have the area of a triangle should be equal to 21.217622239 centimeters squared. Now to work out the area of the sector, we're going to be using the area of the sector equation. So area of sector is equal to theta over 360 degrees. times it by pi, times it by r squared. Now we know what the angle is, which is 60 degrees, and we know what the radius is, which is 11 degrees. So again, 
all I'm going to do is sub substitute those values into the equation equals 60 degrees over 360 degrees times it by pi times it by 11 squared which equals 63.35555485185 centimeters squared now to find the shaded region, we're going to subtract the area of the sector with the area of the triangle. So, shaded region So, area of sector minus area of triangle. We know what the area of the sector is, which is 63.35555485185 centimeters squared minus the area of the triangle, which was 20. 1.217622239 centimeters squared which equals 40.5 Seven, eight, two, nine, four, six centimeters squared. Now to find the percentage, we're going to be dividing the shaded region with the area of the sector, and then we're going to multiply it by a hundred, which gives us the percentage. So we have forty-two. Point one three seven eight two nine four six centimeters squared over the area of the sector, which is sixty three point three five five. Four, five, one, eight, five centimeters squared, and then we're going to multiply it by a hundred, which gives us a percentage. which equals to 66.5101869 rounded up to one decimal place which is 66.5%
Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 18. 16 raised to the power of 1 over 5 times 2 raised to the power of x equals 8 raised to the power of 3 over 4. Work out the exact value of x. So question 18 is all about indices. So it's very important that you have a strong understanding of the main indices rules. On the left hand side of the equation we have 16 raised to the power of 1 over 5 times 2 raised to the power of x. My first step is to convert 16 to a base number that is 2 raised to the power of unknown. Now we need to ask ourselves this question. How many times do I need to multiply 2 by itself to equal 16? Well the answer is 4 times. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16. Therefore, 2 raised to the power of 4 equals 16. So we now have 2 raised to the power of 4 in brackets raised to the power of 1 over 5 times by 2 raised to the power of x equals 8 raised to the power of 3 over 4. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the right hand side of the equation. I'm going to convert 8 in a form of a base number 2. How many times do I need to multiply 2 by itself to equal 8? Well, the answer is 2 times 2 times 2. I'm going to multiply it 3 times, which equals 8. So 2 times 2 times 2 equals 8. Just going to simplify it further. So we have 3 twos. So it's 2 raised to the power of 3 equals 8. Now we have, let me extend this, we have in brackets 2 raised to the power of 4, close bracket raised to the power of 1 over 5 times 2 raised to the power of x equals 2 raised to the power of 3 in brackets raised to the power of 3 over 4. I'm now going to multiply the power outside the brackets with the power inside the brackets. I'm going to do this to the left hand side and the right hand side of the equation. So 4 times 1 over 5 equals 2 raised to the power of 4 over 5 times 2 raised to the power of x equals 3 times 3 over 4 which equals 2 raised to the power of 9 over 4. So when the base numbers are the same and we are multiplying we're going to add the powers together. So we should have effectively 2 raised to the power of 4 over 5 plus x equals 2 raised to the power of 9 over 4. Now I need to find a number when you add to 4 over 5 that equals to 9 over 4. Well this number is 1.45. So therefore the value of x should equal to 1.45. Thank you for watching. Can you please like and subscribe? Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 19. 
2 minus x plus 2 over x minus 3 minus x minus 6 over x plus 3 can be written as a single fraction in the form ax plus b over x squared minus 9, where a and b are integers. Work out the value of a and the value of b. When we add or subtract fractions, we must ensure that the denominators are the same. Our aim is to ensure that the denominator is equal to x squared minus 9 x squared minus 9 is known as the difference between two squares. Therefore, x squared minus 9 is equal to, open bracket, x plus 3, close bracket, x minus 3. Now let's have a look at the question. I'm just going to rewrite the question now. So we have 2 over 1 minus x plus 2 over x minus 3 minus x minus 6 over x plus 3. Now let's have a look at the right hand side of the fraction, this part of the fraction. We need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by its conjugate to equal x squared minus 9. So, minus open bracket, x minus 6, close bracket, open bracket, x minus 3, close bracket, over open brackets x plus 3 close brackets x minus 3. Now I'm going to focus on the fraction in the middle. I'm going to multiply it by its conjugate which is x plus 3. So we should have minus open bracket x plus 2 close bracket x plus 3 close bracket over open bracket x minus 3 close bracket x plus 3, close brackets. Now on the left hand side of the fraction, we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by x plus 3 and x minus 3. So we should have 2 open bracket x plus 3 close bracket open bracket x minus 3 close bracket over x plus 3 close bracket x minus 3 close brackets. At this point I'm just going to expand the brackets. So we have x times x which is x squared. We have x times negative 3 which is minus 3x. Minus 6 times x which is minus 6x. Minus 6 times negative 3 which is plus 18, 
close bracket minus over here. We have x times x, which again, which is x squared. x times 3, which is 3x. Two times x, which is two x, and two times three, which is six. Close bracket. And the last one will be x times x, which is x squared. X times negative three, which is negative three x x times x, sorry, 3 times x, which is 3x, 3 times negative 3, which is minus 3, sorry, minus 9, over x squared minus 9. I'm now going to simplify it further, so I'm going to start on the left hand side and work my way through to the right hand side. Um, so we, we should have x squared minus 9 over here, so 2 open brackets x squared minus 9 close brackets minus x squared plus 3, sorry, x squared plus 5x plus 6, close brackets, minus, open brackets, x squared minus 9x plus 18, close brackets, over x squared minus 9. Now I'm going to expand the brackets. 2 times x squared, which is 2x, 2x squared, sorry, 2 times negative 9, which is minus 18, minus 1 times x squared is minus x squared, minus 1 times 5x, which is minus 5x, Minus 1 times it by 6, which is negative 6. Minus 1 times x squared, which is negative x squared. Minus 1 times it by negative 9x, which is plus 9x. Minus 1 times it by positive 18, which is minus 18. Over x squared minus 9. I'm going to simplify it further. So 2x squared minus x squared minus x squared cancel out. So it gives us 0x squared. So we don't need to write it down. We have minus 5x plus 9x, which gives us positive 4x. And we also have minus 18, minus 6, minus 18, which gives us negative 42 over x squared minus 9. So therefore, the value of a is 4, and the value of b is negative 42.
Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 20. The diagram shows part of the graph of y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. A. By drawing a suitable straight line, use your graph to find estimates for the solution of x squared minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract x squared minus 3x minus 1 from x squared minus 2x plus 3. So we have y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3 minus 0 equals x squared minus 3x minus 1. So y minus 0 is y. x squared minus x squared is 0x squared, so we don't need to write that down. Minus 2x minus minus 3x gives us x 3 minus minus 1 is plus 4. Now I'm going to draw y equals x plus 4. To do that, I'm just going to draw a quick table. So x values minus 2. And y values. We have 0 and 2. Minus 2 plus 4 is 2, 0 plus 4 is 4, 2 plus 4 is 6. So minus 2 and 2 over here, 0 and 4 over here, and 2 and 6 over here. So now we're going to draw a straight line that connects the points together. So I've just drawn y equals x plus 4. Now to find the estimates for the solutions, we're going to be drawing lines from the point of intersections. So there's two points of intersection, so one over here going down, and we're going to read the values over here. The second one is over here, which is pointing downward, which is over here. So therefore, the answers are minus 0.3 to estimate and three so that's your final answer so that's minus 0 0.3 and 3 P is a point on the graph of y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3, where x equals 2. Calculate and estimate for the gradient of the graph at the point P. So what we need to do is we need to draw a gradient that touches the curve once at x equals 2. So at x equals 2, so let me just draw a line. Now we need to find... the difference of dy by dx the difference between this point and this point is 2.1 and the difference between this point and this point is 1.3 therefore therefore to find the gradient we're going to be dividing 2.1 over 1.3 which will give us gradient as 1.6 and that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Many thanks. 
Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we're focusing on question 21. The diagram shows three identical circles inside a rectangle. Each circle touches the other two circles and the sides of the rectangle are shown in the diagram. The radius of each circle is 24 millimeters. Work out the area of the rectangle. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Okay, so how do we work out the area of a rectangle? Well, to work out the area of a rectangle, we need to multiply the width by the height. Okay, so area of rectangle is equal to width times the height how do we work out the width well we can work out the width by adding the four radius together so for example this is the first radius which is 24 millimeters this is the second radius which is 24 millimeters third radius which is 24 millimeters and the fourth which is 24 millimeters okay so I'm just gonna put, put that down 24 24 24 so if I add the radius the full radius together it will give us the width so 24 plus 24 plus 24 plus 24 equals 90 98 millimeters so the width is 98 millimeters to calculate the height of the rectangle we need to form a triangle in the middle this triangle is an equilateral triangle as all the sides add up to 48 millimeters so that's two radiuses and that's two radius so this is an equilateral triangle and all the length add up to 48 48 48 millimeters 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 So to find the height, I'm going to split this triangle in half. Oops. And straight away you should notice that it will form a right angle triangle. So this is a right angle triangle. And I know this triangle is an equilateral triangle as all the sides are the same. So therefore this particular angle and this angle and this angle are, e are all equal and equal to 60 degrees. Okay, so let me just quickly draw out a triangle. Relax. 
Okay, so this is my triangle inside this particular triangle here. So I know that the hypotenuse is 48 millimeters. This angle over here is 60 degrees. And I want to find the height. So I have the hypotenuse and I have the angle, but I want to find this length. So we're going to be using trigonometry and we're going to be using the sine function. So sine theta is equal to opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So I'm just going to fill in the details. So sine 60 equals x over 48. I'm going to make x the subject by multiplying both sides by 48. Therefore, 48 times sine 60 equals x. Therefore, the value of x is equal to, therefore, the value of x is 8. I'm going to add 24 millimeters twice as, for example, as I know the height. So I to find the uh, height of this rectangle, I'm going to add this particular radius, which is 24, and this particular radius, which is 24. So therefore, I need to add 24 times 2 and add it to the, this particular height. So height, which is 41.56921938 millimeters plus 24 millimeters plus 24 millimeters equals 89 0.5 Six nine two one nine three eight millimeters. Now, to find the area of this rectangle, we're going to multiply the height by the width so it's 89.56921938 millimeters times it by 98 millimeters equals 
point six oops which equals eight thousand five hundred and ninety eight point six four five O six five millimeters squared. We're going to round it to three significant figures. Therefore, the answer is eight thousand six hundred millimeters squared. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 22. Here are the first five terms of a sequence. 4, 11, 22, 37 and 56. Find an expression in the form of n for the nth term of the sequence. So question 22 involves quadratic sequences. When we deal with quadratic sequences, we should leave our answer in the form of an squared plus bn plus c. So our final answer should look like this. a n squared plus b n plus c. What we need to do first is find the first difference. So let me just write the sequence out again. So we have 4, 11, 22, 37, and 56. So the difference between 11 and 4 is 7. The difference between 22 and 11 is 11 difference between 34 and 22 is 15 and the difference between 56 and 37 is 19 so that's the first difference I'm just going to put FD down now I need to find the second difference so difference between 11 and 7 is 4 difference between 15 and 11 is 4, difference between 19 and 15 is 4, so SD is 4. Now to find the value of A we need to divide the second difference by 2, so 4 divided by 2 is 2, therefore A is 2, so 2N squared is our first part of the quadratic sequence. What we need to do next is form a table. One. And I'm just going to fill in details. So this is nth term. One, two, three, four, five. Sequence. Four, eleven, twenty-two. 37 and 56 2 and squared 1 squared times by 2 is 2 1 sorry 2 squared times by 2 is 8 
3 squared times by 2 is 18. 4 squared times by 2 is 32. 5 squared times by 2 is 50. Now we're going to subtract sequence. minus 2 and squared 4 minus 2 is 2 11 minus 8 is 3 22 minus 18 is 4 37 minus 32 is 5 and 56 minus 50 is 6 at this point we're just going to use our linear sequences skills to find the nth term of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the difference between here is 1. The difference between 3 and 4 is 1. The difference between 5 and 4 is 1. The difference between 5 and 6 is 1. Uh, therefore, our nth term should look like n, 1n, sorry, plus 1. And now I'm just going to add the second, sorry, the first part to it. So plus 2n squared. And that is your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and, and subscribe. Hi and welcome to Math Together. In this lesson we'll be focusing on question 23. L is a circle with equation x squared plus y squared equals 4. P, open brackets, 3 over 2, square root of 7 over 2, is a point on L. Find an equation of the tangent to L at the point P. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw circle L, x squared plus y squared equals 4, and also have point P on circle L. Our second step is to find the gradient of the line that passes through the origin and point P. To find the gradient of the line, we need to find the change in Y divided by the change of X. So, we should have square root of 7 over 2 divided by 3 over 2. When we divide fractions, you're going to take the reciprocal of the right fraction and then you're going to multiply it. So effectively what we have is square root of 7 over 2 times 2 over 3, which equals 2 square root 7 over 6. This can be simplified further, so we have square root 7 over 3. So the gradient, which the line goes from the origin to P, is square root 7 over 3. So that's the gradient. Our next step is to find the perpendicular gradient. Now to find the perpendicular gradient, we need to set this equation up. So we have gradient of the line O to P, which is square root 7 over 3 times it by the gradient 2 gradient 2 is the perpendicular uh, line equals minus 1. Now I need to rearrange the equation to make gradient 2 the subject. So gradient
is equal to minus 3 over square root 7. So the perpendicular gradient is negative 3 over square root 7. Now that I have the perpendicular gradient, which is negative 3 over 7, I need to find the equation of the line of the perpendicular line. And the way we can do that is by substituting the values of x and y, which in this case is x being 3 over 2 and y being square root of 7 over 2, back into the equation. For, so, for example, y equals negative 3 over square root 7 x plus c and we know the value of x in this in this example which is 3 over 2 so this is x and we know what the value of y is which is square root 7 over 2. So this is the y value. Close brackets. Now at this point all I'm going to do is substitute the value of x and y back into this equation to find the value of c. So we should have square root 7 over 2 equals negative 3 over square root 7 open bracket 3 over 2 close bracket plus C all we're going to do now is rearrange the equation to make C the subject but before we do that let's just expand the bracket so Negative 3 times it by 3 is negative 9. Square root 7 times 2 is 2 square root 7. Plus C. And on this side we have square root 7 plus, sorry, over 2. I'm going to make C the subject by adding 9 over 2 square root 7 to both sides of the equation. So we should have square root 7 over 2 plus 9 over 2 square root 7 equals C. Now to add or subtract fractions, we need to ensure that the denominators are the same. Now let's have a look at the left hand side of a fraction. To make the denominator the same, the 2, we're going to multiply it by square root 7. Therefore we're also going to multiply the numerator by square root 7. So we should have square root 7 times it by square root 7. over square root 7 times it by 2 plus 9 over 2 square root 7 equals C. Now square root 7 times square root 7 is 7. Square root 7 times it by 2 is 2 square root 7. So we should have 7 over 2 square root 7 plus 9 over 2 square root 7 equals C. Just going to add the fractions together. So that's 16 over 2 square root 7 equals C 
going to simplify it further. 8 over square root 7 equals C. Therefore, the tangent of the line that passes through P is Y equals negative 3 over square root 7 X plus 8 over square root 7. So that's your final answer. Thank you for watching and can you please like and subscribe.